unfortunately hypertension um, as they say is a silent killer where uh, adults above the age of 55 in fact the six out of ten of them we need to embrace the culture of evidence-based decision making Welcome to the Science Capsule, a Gates Pharma podcast series, where we get to have conversations with experts in the field of medical research. I'm Ivan Sambagara, a product manager with Gates Pharma. I'll be your host for today's series of the Science Capsule. Our topic today will be navigating the evolving landscape of cardiac care. To help us with this subject, we have with us Professor Fred Bukachi. Welcome. Thank you. Delighted to be here this afternoon. Great. So I'll take, for the sake of our listeners, and take you through the brief bio of uh, Professor Bukachi. He is a physician cardiologist, having done his master's in cardiology at the Imperial College, University of London. He also did a PhD in cardiology at the Umea University in Sweden. He is a fellow of the European Soci Society of Cardiology and a member of several other medical associations. Professor Bukachi is also a senior lecturer and associate professor at the Department of Medical Physiology, College of Health Science at the University of Nairobi. He is also the director for Center of Excellence for Non-Communicable Diseases, also at the University of Nairobi. He is a honorary consultant cardiologist at the Kenyatta National Hospital, Nairobi, Kenya. Professor Bukachi enjoys working in the university setup where he is involved in clinical research work bias towards cardiovascular medicine and physiology. His current research activities include exercise physiology, aging and the cardiovascular system, natural products cardiovascular medicine, laboratory models of diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and metabolic syndrome. Professor Bukachi has also been involved in numerous research and publications. So that's a brief bio of Professor Bukachi. I still feel I have not done justice to your non CV, but for the sake of our listeners, I believe that will suffice for today. Absolutely, yes. I think it's been a generous uh, introduction. Thank you, Ivan. All right, great. So, before we delve into our topic of discussion today, so from your profile, I'll be that uh, prof, you've been involved in so many research work, especially in the field of cardiology. So maybe if you could let us know, at what point did you decide I want to venture into cardiology and field and uh, specifically research in this field? Kindly share with us, Eugene. Uh, many thanks and uh, um, for providing the space to be able to share with the audience about my journey into cardiology and what I'm doing at the moment. Um, it's way back when I was studying my Master of Medicine at the University of Nairobi, my research work was on hypertension. Uh, I was looking at uh, the effect of hypertension on the heart using cardiac ultrasound or echocardiography. I did realize at that time that uh, hypertension is a driver of most of the cardiovascular problems we see, um, strokes, heart failure, kidney failure, among many other. Uh, complications we see. So I got very much attracted to finding out more in terms of uh, uh, the drivers of the cardiovascular problems that we clinicians deal with every day uh, in clinical practice. So it's way back uh, when I was an MED student. All right. Yes. Okay. That's great. So what I've noticed is that indeed actually healthcare has been evolving across different specialties, but if you could narrow down maybe the space of cardiology, and in line with our topic of discussion, navigating the evolving landscape of cardiac care. What are some of the key advances that you've seen in cardiac care across the world? And uh, do you feel that they are accessible globally, I mean locally? A, a very important question, but just to really look at that, um, normally in cardiology we look at what we call five by five, meaning that five risk factors that cause 
the five major non-communicable diseases. So the risk factors would be air pollution, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, poor diet, um, among others. And they usually they lead to all the five big ones, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, cardiopulmonary illnesses, respiratory diseases, for instance, um, mental illness, uh, and so on. So one of the things that uh, attracted me to uh, doing research in uh, cardiovascular medicine was to look at, first of all, uh, the mechanisms uh, of disease in the big five, for instance, hypertension or diabetes, and then all the way to how do we then assist clinicians uh, to be able to identify disease and put patients uh, in the uh, healthcare pathway. So there's been immense um, advances uh, worldwide in terms of different uh, uh, products uh, that are there for interventions. Are they available in the environment? The answer is yes. For instance, the new advances in heart failure, management of uh, uh, clots, for instance, um, management of strokes, uh, management of cancer, all of these uh, have been developed uh, through innovative research and they're available in our country today. Uh, great to know that. Uh, maybe next I would ask you, having done research in other countries, the Western countries and also in Kenya, how do you compare it to the research that is done in Kenya? Is it robust enough and do you feel that... Uh, Okay, to what extent do you feel that it also translates to affecting practice? Interesting question. Uh, current practice worldwide is evidence-based. And that's the reason why uh, people are investing a lot in trying to find out innovative ways to intervene in various diseases. The two terrains are vastly different. Disease distribution is different. Uh, there are overlaps in certain areas. Resources uh, are also different in terms of access. But with regard to research, uh, there are three things we need to look at. One is, what is our culture in terms of decision making? Is it driven by evidence? In other countries, it's all driven by evidence. You can't prescribe unless there is strong evidence to support your prescription. Or you cannot operate on a patient unless there is strong evidence to support that the inter intervention uh, will lead to a good outcome. So there's a culture, and that culture is changing at the moment. There is also the issue of investment in research. Uh, unfortunately, most countries, including our own, don't really invest sufficient in research, and therefore we don't have proper homegrown solutions to our problems. We keep borrowing solutions from different environment. So there is a real issue of culture, resources, and then finally, are we strict about making decisions based on evidence? And the answer is 50-50. Sometimes there are people who make decisions based on evidence. There is another group that makes uh, decisions based on a previous practice. Experience. Exactly. And th that's where the main difference is in terms of what we do here and what happens in other uh, develop jurisdictions. All right. Okay. Great, great, great. That gives us a good perspective in terms of comparisons of the two areas. And uh, next, I wanted to find out, out of the many research that you've been involved, we've seen that you participated in different researches and different topics, most of them inclined to ask a geology. Uh, is there one research that for you stands out in terms of its impact in informing guidelines or changing clinical practice, no country? Um, yes. Um, one of the things I'm very proud about is the team we work with in basic sciences uh, at our basic science campus at the University of Nairobi. Uh, we do lead research in mechanisms of disease, and one of the things we've been looking at is obesity. Remember, obesity is at the center of all the non-communicable diseases, whether it's hypertension, uh, diabetes, cancer, even mental illness. So all these things, uh, obesity is at the center. So one of the things we've been looking at with the, uh, the team of other researchers is what are the drivers in, envir in our environment uh, for obesity? We've been able to develop innovative diet. We've tested this in animal, uh, yes, in, in animals. And interestingly, we call this a cafe 
diet, the kind of diet you like it to pick up from uh, one of the fast foods. Exactly. So we simulated that, uh, redefined that very well in the laboratory and fed the animals to that. Interesting. The obesity rates, rates were rapid. And this is a high fat, mainly saturated fat, high sugar diet. Uh, and we fed the animals to that. And we produced obese animals with all the all the profiles of metabolic syndrome. They, yes, they had dyslipidemia, they had hypertension, uh, they also had uh, many other insulin resistance, the kind of things we see in humans. We then asked ourselves that we have people uh, in slum areas, uh, people who are underprivileged, they don't have access to this kind of diet. So we went out to find out what do they eat in the environment, and we were able to fashion another diet. A high fat diet, you'll find this in most of the underprivileged uh, uh, communities, settings. Uh, high sugar, it's a high starch diet, so that's quite easy. And then we put a low protein because protein is expensive. And interestingly also, this drives obesity very rapidly. But it introduces something else that we observed. When you look at the profile of uh, the amino acids uh, in this particular population, you get the branched chain amino acids, you know, leucine, leucine, rapidly going up. And in fact, we then stumbled on what looked like pre-diabetes syndrome. So we're quite excited about this because we feel that we're quite close to developing uh, a tool that will be able to help you and me detect somebody who is pre-diabetic quite early, knowing too well that the numbers for diabetic patients are rapidly going up. So that is one of our uh, flagship projects, and we are hoping that uh, we can translate this very quickly into an intervention program that we can then be able to advise people, hey, this kind of diet, the cafe-type diets, have really negative impact on your health. Okay. Yeah, I'm we're quite excited it. about that. Ah, interesting. Yes. I've just found that interesting in terms of you saying that uh, this cafe type of diet, you find that that's what everyone will be craving for. Yes. The elite in the society are able to access this in the high-end areas. Yes. But then you also say that even in the resource-limited setups, they have their own versions of the same. And now it means that all of them are equally affected. People in resource-limited setup and even the people in the elite in the society. So it means that this problem of now obesity and lifestyle issues is now cutting across regardless of the, I mean, someone's status in society. Uh, absolutely. And one of the things that informed us was the fact that when you look at the spectrum of our patients who have uh, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and the related complications, uh, they're neither people from high end. Uh, affluent society or people who live in slums. It actually cuts across. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that uh, uh, informed us was the fact that um, when you look at the type of patients you have in Europe and North America, they tend to have these diseases from mid-50s going up. Mm -hmm. Our patients are much younger. We are seeing patients as young as uh, 40 to 45. Blood pressures are going up. They are uh, obese, yes, much earlier. But of course, there are other factors that drive that. So we also believe that there may be other pathophysiological mechanisms or pathobiological mechanisms that affect our own vessels, blood vessels. And that may be some of the things that we're exposed to too early uh, in life. They could be related to diet. They could as well be related to infection. And we do have other research programs we're trying to develop to look at vascular aging uh, in uh, health individuals. And, and that may give us an answer as to why we observe uh, these diseases almost a decade to two decades earlier. That the, exactly, yes. Compared to the Western yeah. world. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. interesting. Um, hopefully we'll have that information can be shared and just to enlighten the society. Absolutely, once we have it, we're going to get it uh, published in peer review journals and... Uh, um, we can get that out. Okay, yes, that's great. Uh, going through your profile, I also noticed that uh, in 
2022 at the European Society of Cardiology Conference in Athens, Greece. You presented something on the epidemiology of hypertension in Africa. Could kindly tell us a bit about your presentation. Yes, um, exciting. Another exciting piece of work. We are doing this as collaborative work under the Pan-African Society of Cardiology. We were developing um, a concept document to be able to look at the differences between our hypertensive patients okay. and the kind of hypertensive patients we see uh, in the rest of the world, especially in the Caucasian population. So my segment of the presentation was just to look at the the epidemiology, right. and uh, uh, our numbers are bad. Locally here in Kenya, for instance, uh, from the STEP survey we conducted in 2015, that's a national survey, it's available online, um, almost one in every four Kenyans have got elevated hypertension. And that's quite a serious statistic when you look at the, uh, the numbers. Our patients also tend to be younger. I did mention that a little earlier. We, the peak age for most of our hypertensions is actually in the mid-40s. Then we do have another peak late in the 60s, so younger patients. But what is even more interesting about the epidemiology is that our patients come with more aggressive disease, um, blood pressures of 180, 190, 200. And more disturbing is the fact that they come to us with complications, the typical complications that uh, patients have with hypertension. They have mild strokes or trans, transient ischemic attacks. Uh, they have heart failure. Uh, they have kidney disease or peripheral arterial disease. So in summary, in terms of epidemiology of hypertension, we have a completely different picture. Young patients, mm -hmm. aggressive disease, presenting with complications. Interesting. Uh, maybe on that bit of aggressive disease, maybe if you could expound further. What could be the reason why like, it's more aggressive in our population if we compare it to maybe other populations? It comes down, again, a very important question uh, which should inform our uh, prevention strategies comes down to uh, our uh, genetic uh, evolutionary biology. Um, Africans, by their nature, we live in the tropics and therefore we conserve water or we conserve salt. But over time, in fact, over the last 100 or so years, uh, we've had this steady and rapid increase in the numbers of hypoten hypertensives. What has changed? One constant fact is likely to be diet, uh, high salt quantity in our diet, and therefore we are taking in significantly more salt than what is recommended. Okay. And that means that we're retaining more water because our pathobiology is such that we are uh, water retainers because exactly we consume because of the heat and when you do that then we increase our vascular volume and that drives uh, uh, blood pressure and that may be one of the uh, key relationships that uh, we can put our finger on very confidently and say that high salt intake has driven this uh, and of course on the other side of treatment we know that um, whatever treatment you give hypertensive patients in sub-Saharan Africa, you need to add a diuretic. Uh, yes, because that exactly it's exactly it's more effective. Um, it's an add-on uh, treatment which helps us to reduce blood pressure uh, effectively. So yeah, uh, great. And also the bit on the complications, could it be also an aspect of our health-seeking behaviors? So that you find that uh, it takes longer before someone goes and has a checkup and maybe they can pick their prehypertensive and interventions are done before. And, but now it's because we are not going for early treatment and now complications are what manifest and that's how we pick the people hypertensive. You're spot on. Uh, there are a number of factors. I think you're spot on in terms of a health-seeking behavior and there are a number of uh, um, factors that determine when uh, or uh, when patients seek uh, medical attention with that well. Unfortunately, hypertension, um, as they say, is a silent killer because there is no pain. And therefore, patients with hypertension will go about their businesses without ever feeling any discomfort. 
In fact, the discomfort is usually a sign of a complication. Maybe their eyes are blurred. Maybe they have a headache. Maybe they have chest pain. Uh, that may actually be a sign of uh, early complication. So health-seeking behavior, yes, that's part of it. But beneath that is the fact that we're dealing with a disease that uh, doesn't show uh, any discomfort um, until one develops uh, uh, complications. But we also have uh, another issue that's not to the patient, that's a health systems issue. We insist in the guidelines that we developed in 2018 for this country uh, in, our, in Kenya, that every patient must have a blood pressure check irrespective of what takes them to see a medical practitioner. Whether it's a flu, whether it's a, uh, a red eye or an earache, whatever takes them to see or to seek medical care, uh, at that point they must have blood pressure taken. That's go going to be the only thing uh, or the only opportunity we have to be able to pick, pick up. And we do pick up lots of hypertensives uh, uh, just by uh, those kind of screening exercises. Of course, we also advise people to have their blood pressure checked uh, at least uh, on every occasion. They have an opportunity or once a year if they can manage to do that. <laughs> it, it's true. <laughs> so we have patient related issues and also systems related issues. And of course, now we have the issue about after diagnosis, do we link these patients to healthcare or to facilities? You can make a diagnosis that your blood pressure is high, but do we actively then advise these patients that look, you need to be followed up by a healthcare professional to put you on the right treatment. So there's an issue now that we link patients onto healthcare providers, but do their healthcare providers have the necessary tools, including medications, to provide yes. adequate care? Yes. And we've tried to argue out all this in our national cardiovascular disease guidelines. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And now that bit where you're talking about uh, hypertension being a disease where there's no pain, as you say, how is it with the compliance? Now I'm thinking this patient went to the outpatient setup. They just said a minor injury. Their BP is taken, they found to be hypertensive. Now they're told you need to be on this medication. Yet they're not feeling anything. How does this complicate management or compliance for this patient? Another very interesting question in terms of uh, compliance. In fact, uh, in our step survey, um, it was quite uh, astounding. Um, just a small percentage of patients, less than 5% of patients uh, who are diagnosed hypertensives had their blood pressures controlled to target. Okay. Less than 5%, despite all the advances we've made in terms of medications and so on. But first and foremost, healthcare practitioners need to briefly stop and just tell the patient something about the disease. Tell them one, in one minute. Uh, patient this education. Patient education is important. Just at that time the diagnosis has been made, tell them something about hypertension, that you are likely to take medication lifelong, that if we are to remove you from medication, it may be under exceptional circumstances. Otherwise, you are likely to be on medication lifelong. We may reduce the dose. So that is the first point that uh, is likely to lead to compliance or non-compliance. The second thing is the number of pills that you give a patient who is not hurting. Okay. Somebody has a systolic blood pressure of 200, and you probably say, well, I'm going to go for the combo of four maximum dose tablets. So you give them sing you give them separate pills, four of them. This person is unlikely to take this medication for a long time. And therefore, we are advising about single pill, combined pills, to be a, exactly fixed dose combinations or single pill combinations to be able to reduce the pill burden. Because we know from evidence that this helps in terms of compliance. And then there's an the issue of follow-up and also there's an the issue of cost uh, of care. Because cost we know is a deterrent to access to healthcare. So we have to work out a mechanism where um, under our national drugs guidelines and the ones available to most populations, they have to be at a possibly lowest cost, affordable cost. 
But we also need to push this argument and begin to ask insurance companies, especially the National Health Insurance Company, which are uh, fund, which covers a large sector of the population. They need to invest in providing uh, medications to our patients because then we reduce complications long term. Um, yes. For and, uh, just picking up from another point you mentioned there, from your uh, data, the epidemiology of hypertension in Africa, you said that up to one in four patients are hypertensive. So is this number possibly likely to be a modest estimation considering that not many people go to be screened and find out that they're hypertensive? Um, that is more like a national estimate from a survey, and I must emphasize they had elevated pressure by definition of de by defining uh, blood hypertension. Of course, you need repeated measures, especially people who have what would be like grade one hypertension. But there are people grade two and above, they're certainly hypertensive on first occasion when you measure the blood pressure. Now, so we think that one in four is modest. However, we do have uh, um, other community data available to us. I think uh, one of the old studies we have was uh, from the Rift Valley in this country, uh, the Nakuru city, um, where um, adults above the age of 55, in fact, the six out of 10 of them were hypertensive. And that is perhaps the highest recorded in this country. So we think that there may be pockets and communities where, in fact, even 50% of people above the age of 50 years may be hypertensive. So the solution for us is to emphasize screening. And once we do that, they need to be linked to care. Okay. Yes. All right. It just, just gives us a context on how big the problem is. Okay. All right. <clears throat> you mentioned it earlier that uh, one of the things when you're comparing the research in Western world and in our country, resourcing is a key challenge. And I think this is something that is faced by most researchers or people who are aspiring to get into research. Uh, apart from this, which other challenges have you encountered in research and maybe what are your suggestions in addressing this challenge? Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, um, I talked about the culture. We need to embrace the culture of evidence-based decision-making so that that means that you just can't go prescribing without asking yourself, what is the evidence to support my decision? So that's one thing, so a cultural shift. Of course, we talked about the resources. We don't have a sufficient resource, although in our country and other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, we actually have government policies that in fact compel government to spend a particular percentage of the GDP on research. Whether that is practice or not is another matter altogether. <laughs> yes. So we also need to make sure that we encourage politicians and policymakers to uh, invest, put enough investment uh, in research. But going forward, uh, when you have scarce resources, I think you can be able to pull your resources together and form centers of excellence. So you share resources. Set up a reference laboratory, for instance, where you can do high-end research. So we don't have to get all the 20 universities in this country or in East Africa doing many substandard research. We can be able to pull our resources together and make sure that we share resources and set up a center of excellence. And I think that resource sharing will be an important way of trying to reduce the burden uh, of research on one particular uh, institution. But uh, the other thing is we also need to reward researchers. I mean, I'm a clinical cardiologist, so uh, uh, I'm likely to drift into seeing patients or doing procedures because uh, that gives me more financial reward than spending time uh, in the laboratory trying to find answers or in the community trying to find answers to problems that affect our patients. So I think we need to reorient the way we reward our researchers. Uh, it should be as robust and as effective as the way we reward uh, our clinical practitioners. Uh, yeah. All right, all right. That's a good uh, pointer. Yeah. And just something you mentioned on uh, creating centers of excellence and you're talking about maybe different 
facilities or institutions pulling their resources and working together. In your cardiac research, cardiology research, uh, interacting with your colleagues and peers, are people always willing to come together and work together or people always want to be working separately and doing their own things? Maybe for who will take the credit for this? A very interesting question, um, but I think this may partly be informed by our school system. I think our school system cultivated more competition than uh, collaboration. Yes, so I think then our um, practitioners or researchers some, to some extent don't grow out of uh, the competition uh, mode of operating. In fact, I think in life you are better off when you uh, collaborate, you complement each other, you actually achieve a lot more. And that has become more difficult to be able to create robust uh, uh, institutions of excellence. I mean, all universities want to uh, provide the same course that could be provided effectively by one university as a center of excellence, and then we get another university to provide. Exactly. So, yes. So we can be able to do that effectively. So it's a way of having to rediscuss our approach to the way we want to move forward, especially when you have... Uh, uh, resource limitations. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, great. So maybe when you're talking to other, if you are to address maybe other young doctors or aspiring researchers, yes. maybe what would be your advice to them? And uh, like what should they expect when delving into research, medical research, or in, particularly in cardiology where you have much experience in? Um, first of all, to uh, young doctors or young researchers, um, for me it's a privilege working as a cardiologist. It's a very rewarding field, very demanding in many ways, but enjoyable overall. They need to understand to train as a cardiologist, there's no shortcut. It takes a much longer period of time uh, to stay through uh, school, so to speak, uh, until you develop the necessary skills for patient safety. But if you want to get into research, there's additional training required uh, that then gives you the necessary tools and necessary knowledge that you require to be able to perform uh, good level research. But also beyond that, you also need to be thinking about if I'm developing research, how can I collaborate with other researchers within the country, within the region, and in the world, but that means that you have to get into an area um, that is cutting edge so that you attract attention from people who are likely to collaborate with you. So my advice would be cardiology is an exciting field. Uh, anybody uh, intending to join the field, highly welcome. In fact, we are looking for more young doctors to be able to mentor through the field. But more importantly, they also need to begin looking at how to get themselves into cardiovascular research. Uh, we aren't strong in that area, as strong as we are in clinical practice. Uh, we need to develop our own homegrown solutions to look at our problems that affect our patients. We also need to begin looking at our own uh, local interventions. There could be medical care interventions or procedure-based interventions that will help our own unique population of patients we have in our country and the region. Okay. Yes. And talk about the unique population of patients in our country. Um, while interacting with some doctors and discussing some trials, there are an issue that always came up in terms of uh, underrepresentation of the blacks population in most of these studies. So, have we made progress in this? And uh, because you realize that there are usually those racial differences in terms of response to some medication. So you present a trial that was saying it was this effective, but the bulk of the population was Caucasians or Asians and the few blacks. Have we made progress in this? Have we made progress in that area? Um, the answer is no. Um, and there are a number of factors. I think partly we've discussed um, in terms of getting international uh, uh, clinical trials uh, being performed in sub-Saharan Africa or recruiting African patients into those uh, clinical trials, we haven't made much progress. 
there is progress, but it's very little. And there are a number of reasons. One is uh, uh, our own investment into research platforms, because we need certain level laboratories uh, to be able to perform that. They have to have international accreditation. And Africa has very few of those laboratories. We're fortunate in our own country, we do have a number of laboratories now that have reached uh, that international accreditation. So we have to invest in getting the, our labs at that level. Do we have enough uh, trained research scientists in clinical trials? The numbers are small. So we also need to begin getting enough of our own researchers trained in clinical trials. Um, this is actively happening. It's happening slowly. And therefore, we haven't been able to get to where uh, we, need, we need to get. And then uh, finally is the issue of patient demographics. Um, there is something quite uh, obvious that people never think about. Um, whereas we prescribe for patients in this part of the world, sometimes it's very difficult to get the patient back, uh, even for follow-up, um, losing patients to follow-up, uh, or other factors that uh, may affect patients' mobility back to the clinical trial center. So there are multiple factors, and you don't want to invest in a clinical trial where at the end of the year or at the end of two years, you've lost a large segment of your patients because you can't, you can't trust them. So there are multiple factors that affect that. Uh, however, we are happy that we've identified all those uh, shortcomings and at different levels, uh, they're being addressed. Quite right, yes. Ah, interesting. So this actually impacts not only the doctors, but now you're also talking about patients needing to know why it's important to go back for a visit or a review if they are under doing their part of a study. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's true. Um, so patients need to know why it's important for them to participate in a trial. But something else that we always uh, miss to uh, recognize is that our policy makers are also afraid to provide uh, support. This is legal support uh, in terms of ethical approval. I think you probably must have heard in the media at one time when um, certain trials were supposed to be performed. There was all this uh, talk about patients being used as guinea pigs. In fact, that's a complete misrepresentation. All the medical products and devices you see today have had to be tested yes. on human subjects. Human subjects somewhere in the world volunteered themselves under informed consent to participate. So we also need to begin accepting uh, that culture, that we can be part of that mainstream from a policy perspective and also from the patient perspective, that we can volunteer ourselves to be part of uh, groups that will be able to provide us with local answers in terms of how diseases respond to different interventions, especially medical interventions. Okay. Yeah. All right. That is great. Uh, apart from the challenges of funding and maybe uh, support towards research, what other challenges there have been you've experienced in doing research? Is there any additional challenge that you could pick out? Um, usually we divide the challenges in research in terms of um, uh, the culture, which I have already uh, discussed. We have systems uh, uh, limitations or challenges, I've discussed that, uh, and systems will have to be in terms of uh, physical infrastructure, like the laboratories that uh, you need to be able to do high-end research and also be part of international uh, research. And then we have uh, medical legal issues where you need support from ethical teams. And then I have discussed briefly about uh, uh, policy segment um, in terms of a policymaker's uh, uh, embracing research as one of the ways in which we need to get uh, solutions to our common problems. So in general, those are the uh, areas that uh, uh, do affect us. Of course, the issue about funding, uh, we cannot um, overemphasize that. That's big, been a big issue um, over the years. All right.
And on the beat of police, it seems to be coming up so much as affecting the quality of research you're having or even the funding towards that. Uh, what could be done to get more people? Maybe I'm thinking getting more researchers or doctors to be part of the policy makers to help now make, help guide the policy that will support this. I think a number of ways to look at this. Um, one is policy as of government laying down the framework for research because it has to be spelled out quite clearly that uh, uh, in our government documents in terms of policy to uh, reduce the impact of hypertension, diabetes, or cancer, it has to be in a clear, clearly stated framework. So it has to be in a policy document. Right. Now, this policy will then guide funding towards any activities without that within that area and also um, it will guide uh, ethical conduct if you are to provide uh, to perform any research in, in that area so it's a whole a whole spectrum um, so the question is how do you then um, make the environment better from the policy perspective I think one is education we need to engage our policymakers uh, to be part of the team uh, so they understand that when you inv invest in research and provide a proper research environment, then you're likely to attract more researchers into that space, okay. locally and internationally, because I would be very hesitant to invest in a research project in an environment where I can't get ethical approval to conduct uh, my research. So those are the things that we need to look at. So policymakers need to be part and parcel of uh, the journey towards making the environment better. What about the population? I think we need to do more uh, public education to be able to uh, let them know, or everyone needs to know, that all interventions you use today okay. were tested at one point on a human being somewhere, okay. and you could be one of those human beings that can volunteer for that. Yes. So an um, issue of public awareness, greater public awareness. Absolutely. That would be very important in terms of improving public awareness, like on many other issues. Okay. Yeah. Do you think we need more doctors or researchers in parliament to help push this agenda? Maybe more resourcing or funding towards research? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, in a resource-constrained environment like ours, I'd be happy as a cardiologist to work uh, in my space as a cardiologist uh, rather than having to go to parliament because I can be able to get uh, my policy uh, through parliament, uh, through a committee that understands health issues. So it doesn't have to be uh, a doctor or a healthcare practitioner there. So that's one aspect to it. But just before you proceed, I'm yes. thinking you have a doctor sitting in that committee that yes. maybe can make a more informed decision compared to maybe someone else who doesn't have that science or medical background. Absolutely. Yeah. Think? Yes. <laughs> and, and that's what I was talking about, the, <laughs> the yes part to it. Okay. The no part was resource constraint, fewer specialists, and therefore you don't want to have all your specialists aspiring to go to become MCAs and members of parliament. Okay, then I'll draft doctors. Exactly. But now, on the other side, when you have teams that have difficulty understanding uh, medical, um, not necessarily jargon, but concepts, conceptually, they require uh, a medical doctor or a healthcare practitioner, doesn't have to be a medical doctor, to be able to help them understand um, the complexities of the practice. And that's why it's important that we get more uh, healthcare personnel, not necessarily doctors, but people who can be able to understand um, the needs, the wants of, of the profession, especially when it comes to addressing the bigger issues that affect uh, uh, the public. Okay. Yes. Sure, sure. That's, that's, that, that's on point. Uh, maybe, Professor, your parting shot, what else would you want to say or add on to this series? Of our podcast today. Delighted you invited me to share uh, my journey and experience in uh, practice of cardiology and my perspective about how uh, we look at things from uh, this part of the world. My parting shot is that 
uh, we need to recognize uh, the big risk factors that drive uh, non-communicable diseases. We need to look at air pollution quality. We need to look at uh, diet. Are we exercising enough? We need to look at sedentary lifestyle. We need to look at smoking um, look and alcohol abuse. We need to look at all those core things that drive our non-communicable diseases, um, including cardiovascular, diabetes, uh, uh, pulmonary diseases, mental illness, and so on. And ask ourselves, are we doing enough to address the big five cardiovascular risk factors? And for doctors intending to join cardiovascular research or research in non-communicable diseases, they need to begin to think about innovative ways in which we can be able to combat obesity, um, air pollution, um, tobacco use, um, among other things that drive our big uh, non-communicable disease uh, spectrum. That way then we begin to uh, get our own homegrown solutions to this. But on the other hand, we also need to make sure that we carry policymakers along with us, uh, knowing too well that we need their support from policy uh, all the way to research and translating that research into practice. practice. Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bukachi, for that enlightening session. Uh, we've been speaking to Professor Frederick Bukachi, a senior cardiologist in Kenya, and he has shared his experiences in the field of uh, cardiology, cardiology research. He has also given us pointers or suggestions on ways that we can improve on the field of medical research and just also mentioned to us some of the challenges and ways that could be addressed. Thank you very much, Professor. So thank you for joining us for this episode of the Science Capsule podcast. Thank you very much.